Hey guys, it's Aremia, and this is my first time trying a hardcore Pokémon Nuzlocke. You're probably familiar with what a Nuzlocke is, but a hardcore Nuzlocke has even more rules to make the game that much more challenging. The first two rules are pretty standard. If a Pokémon faints, it is gone for good, and we can only catch the first Pokémon in each new area. But we're gamers here, so let's make things a little harder. We aren't allowed to overlevel our Pokémon past the next Gym Leader's Ace, we can't use items in battle except for held items, and the battle mode has to always be put on set. With all that said, don't forget to leave a like, and let's begin our journey. The first thing we need to do is head over to Professor Elms and pick up our starter Pokémon. Picking the Grass starter makes for the toughest challenge in this game, so we go with Chikorita and name her Arugula. Aren't you glad I didn't name her something dumb like subscribe? Speaking of which, you should totally hit that sub! After running some errands, we run into this red-haired kid who kindly declares that we're a worthless waste of space before challenging us to our first battle. Arugula tackles him into the ground a few times, and suddenly he's not so talkative. We make our way back to Professor Elms and name our newfound rival Chaz. In retrospect, I probably should have named him THE Chaz, but oh well. Next, our friend Lila shows us how to catch some Pokémon. Just like that! Get it? Yeah, perfectly clear, Lila. She gives us some Pokeballs and our Nuzlocke officially begins. Our first encounter is a Pidgey that we catch and nickname Taya, and Taya has a sturdy body. I swear I didn't plan this. And on our way up to Violet Town, we catch a handful of new Pokemon. A Spearow we name Bokura, a Caterpie we call Flapjack, a Bellsprout we name Predator, and a Geodude we call Geertrude. There are a lot of encounters in this game, so moving forward, I won't mention them unless they actually play an important role in our run. The next gym is Faulkner, the Flying Specialist. The battle starts, and I couldn't be more happy to have Geertrude on the team, because she decimates Faulkner's birds with her stab's super effective rock throw. First badge down. After moving through Union Cave, we witness a shakedown from Team Rocket. We eventually enter Slowpoke Well to stop their evil plan of chopping off and selling Slowpoke Tails. I mean, why would anyone do that? Cause I'm evil. Bakura is able to knock out most of the Team Rocket members we see, and then we make our way to one of the Team Rocket's executives, Proton. Taya takes down his Zubat with a couple quick attacks, and Geertrude eliminates his coughing with Rock Throw. While grinding up for Bugsy, Flapjack evolves into a beautiful Butterfree. You might think we have this in the bag between Geertrude's Rock Throw and having two flying types in Taya and Bakura, but Bugsy's Scyther is no joke, having a 70 base power stab move really early on in the game. But we just have to give it our best shot, so it's time to take on the second gym. Bugsy leads with her monster of a Scyther, and I start with Geertrude. Unfortunately, she immediately uses U-Turn, switches out to Metapod, and we miss our Rock Throw. Not a great start. Geertrude is able to one-shot her Metapod, and she switches back to Scyther, who just U-turns again for big damage, even though it's resisted. And then she brings out her Kakuna. Geertrude manages to land the next Rock Throw, but Kakuna lives on what must be just one HP. I decide to switch in Taya, who takes down Kakuna, with two gusts after she potions. And Scyther comes out yet again. Taya starts whittling it down with gusts, and she lowers our defense with Leer and uses Focus Energy to increase her critical hit rate. Not good. I stay in, and she lands a big quick attack to bring us down to a third. There's no way Taya can survive another quick attack, so I choose to switch in Flapjack. We need to sacrifice something to secure a safe switch in, so unfortunately, Flapjack goes down. We send out Bokura, who tanks another U-turn to below half before returning fire with a stab super effective Aerial Ace for the win. If Bugsy had landed even one critical hit with her Scyther, it could have been the end of the run right there. But tough battles don't end there. We still have to face our rival before leaving Azalea Town. Bakura is able to take down Ghastly, and Quilava just uses Leer, so we can take it out too. He ends with a Zubat, and Geertrude is able to eventually bring it down with Rock Throw. After we enter Elix Forest, we find a ton of Caterpie. But since we already had the Caterpie line, rest in peace, Flapjack, I choose to use the old rod in the pond because a Gyarados would really be a help and add some power to our team. I catch a Magikarp and nickname him Brinelin. Before leaving the forest, we find this guy slamming his head into some trees. He teaches some of our Pokemon Headbutt, 
and we run back to Azalea Town for another encounter. Bree, a Rattata we caught earlier, headbutts the tree and knocks down none other than a Heracross. I am ecstatic. Heracross is a really strong Pokemon to have on our team. I catch and name him Goliath. After a bunch of grinding, we make our way toward Goldenrod and find an Abra in the grass. We throw our best Pokeball at it, and it doesn't work, and it teleports away. Oh well. On our way, Taya evolves into a Pidgeotto, and Rugula evolves into a beastly Bayleaf. And after looting the local warehouse, we're ready to fight Whitney and her infamous Normal-type team. I start with Arugula and she sends in Clefairy. We use Reflect to boost our team's defense for the incoming Terror Cow, and then switch into Goliath, who proceeds to one-shot her Clefairy with a stab super effective Brick Break. Nice. But we aren't done yet because she sends out the one and only Miltank. Goliath brings her down to a quarter with Brick Break, and she uses a Tract followed by a Stomp on Heracross. Then Heracross gets immobilized by Love. She's not even in your same egg group, Goliath. To make matters worse, our Reflect goes down and Goliath takes another stomp down to about half and is immobilized by love yet again. Apparently, he likes being stomped. I decide to switch into Geertrude here because she resists normal moves and is a girl, so she can't be hit with a tract. Geertrude uses Magnitude, leaving Miltank at a sliver, followed by a Super Potion up to almost full health. We continue to get unlucky with Magnitudes and Whitney's Super Potions again. I'm forced to switch into Arugula, who uses Headbutt, and leaves her at a sliver of health again. I finally decide we need to sack something, so I throw an unknown we caught in the ruins of Alf earlier to guarantee a safe switch in. Taya comes in, and after living for what felt like hours, she's finally able to secure the kill with Quick Attack. Third badge acquired. I should be the one crying. On our way up to Ecruteak, Bakura evolves into an amazing Fero, which should definitely add some power and speed to our team. I don't feel like going to the tower and fighting our rival just yet, so I go exploring for some more encounters. We catch a Magnemite named Kulom and a Machop we call Arnold, among some others. Brynlin also finally evolves into a beastly Gyarados, and we're ready to take on our rival at Burn Tower. Brynlin one-shots his Ghastly with Bite, Geertrude takes out his Magnemite and Quilava with Magnitude, and Bokura brings down his Zubat after a couple of Aerial Aces. Our team is finally coming together. Sometimes foreshadowing is relatively obvious. After all that, Geertrude evolves into a rock-hard Graveler, and we catch a Coughing and name her Nimona, with a P. What, you don't see the resemblance? But unfortunately, that's where the good news has to stop. I was making my way through Morty's Ghost Gym pretty well and thought, man, I should give Arugula some of this experience. But right away, the enemy Haunter uses Mean Look, which prevents us from switching out. Arugula manages to bring the Haunter down to a single HP, but proceeds to hurt herself in confusion two turns in a row before falling to a Nightshade. Oh man. I was planning to turn her into a defensive utility Pokemon with moves like Reflect and Light Screen. Rest easy, sweet princess. No, I don't want to go on. Oh my god! Oh. Well. Back to grinding it is. We eventually make it to Morty, and in a fit of sheer rage at losing Arugula, Brynlin tears through his entire team with super effective Bite. Another badge down. After saving a cute girl from these terrible dance moves, we're granted the Surf HM. We use it right away to snag a Poliwag and name her Cinnabon. Leaving Ecruteak, we make our way down to Olivine and- OH CRAP! Running into random legendaries in the wild is way scarier in a Nuzlocke. We also find this guy who says, I'm first in line for the battle frontier. I haven't slept in days. Get in line if you want to be second one in. Did you hear that, Bellsprout? We're going to be second in line. Anyway, we grab a tentacle and name it Alfredo. But I'm not ready to face the next gem just yet. With Surf, we can make our way up to the Lake of Rage to slay the shiny Gyarados. And darn, I forgot these grunts steal my money. After sacking Meadow the Mill Tank, we managed to take down the Red Gyarados and secure the Red Scale, an important item for later, and no, I forgot again! After some grinding, it's time to take on Chuck and his fighting type gym. Or I would say that, but while I was fighting one of his trainers, their Hitmonchan delivered a critical hit ice punch to take out Brynlin. And it only gets worse. We also lose Damien the Zubat to a Pursuit Rattata, Predator the Bellsprout to a Psyduck's Confusion, and our tentacle Alfredo to a self-destructing Geodude. 
Those were Pokemon I was planning to use against Chuck. I guess we need to train more. We deliver the red scale I mentioned earlier to Mr. Pokemon, and pick up the experience share in exchange. I hadn't boxed Damien yet, so, uh, ignore his dead body. While grinding, we meet this rich kid who says, There are two kinds of people, those with style and those without. And he has all three Kanto starters. He totally had two Game Boys when he was a kid. No, Goliath, don't! That's enough stalling, it's finally time we challenge Chuck for the fifth gym badge. I have had to make some changes to our team with all of our deaths, but I think we have a decent strategy going into it. Chuck sends out Primeape, and I send out Bakura. My secret strategy? Hit it really hard with Aerial Ace. And it works, and Bakura is able to take out his Primeape with a critical hit. He sends out Polyrath, and we use another Aerial Ace to bring him to half while also breaking his focus. That means he can't finish his focus punch. His Citrus Berry brings him out of KO range, but a couple more attacks finish the job. I should have just believed in you first, Bakura. I'm not sure why I was so afraid of his team. I think losing several important Pokemon really got to me. But after the battle, we're gifted with the Fly HM. Boy, that sure would have been nice five minutes ago. With Fly taught to our Firo, we can head over to Mahogany Town to help Lance out with the Team Rocket base. Goliath manages to tear through the Team Rocket members, and we eventually get to battle Petrel. But his team is no match for Geertrude, who destroys all of his Pokemon with Rollout and Magnitude, respectively. The rocket fights don't stop there, though, because we get to fight Ariana in a double battle with Lance. But between the two of us, we make quick work of their teams without any deaths. Cinnabon even manages to evolve afterward. Having a Polyrath would give us some really great type coverage, but I found that Water Stones are ridiculously hard to get in these games. The only way to get one is from the Pokeathon on Wednesdays, a random call from this guy on a Sunday afternoon, or as a random first place prize in the bug catching contest. I decide to try for the bug catching contest and I actually catch a shiny Weedle. No way. Surely this is enough to get first place, right? Right? <sighs> I guess I'll try again later. Unfortunately, we can't use the Weedle because we accidentally ran into the grass earlier and got stuck with a Sunkern. Into the box it goes. Now the level cap for these gyms gets really weird. The cap for the 6th gym is 35, while the level cap for the 7th gym is only 34. So, next up is Price. However, his Ice-type Pokémon prove no use against Goliath's power, as he destroys each of his Pokémon with Stab Brick Break to get us our 6th badge. Or, should I say 7th? Before facing Jasmine, I run some more errands and find these two trainers. Game Freak, you know what you were doing. On this route, we also get a new encounter. We catch a seal and nickname her Symbol. Having some Ice-type attacks for Lance's dragons in the Elite Four should definitely come in handy. We also get a team upgrade as Nimona evolves right at the level cap into a sickly Weezing. I assume looking sickly is a good thing for Weezing. Weezing. Now it's time to take on the Steel Gym Leader, Jasmine. I throw out Geertrude and she sends in one of her two Magnemites. Geertrude is able to decimate it with Earthquake, but then she sends out her ace Pokemon, Steelix. I don't want to leave Geertrude in for a super effective Iron Tail, so I switch into Goliath and she misses her Iron Tail. Nice. We crack back with a huge Brick Break down to a half, and she uses Screech. We use one more Brick Break, and... It leaves Steelix on almost no health before its Citrus Berry activates. And then Calamity strikes. Steelix destroys him with an Iron Tail after Screech halved our defenses. Goliath goes down. Goliath was the powerhouse of our team, so it really hurts to see him fall in a gym battle I thought we had in the bag. There's no time to grieve though, as we send out Cinnabon to revenge kill the Steelix with Surf and finish the battle with a switch into Geertrude for her second Magnemite. We managed to acquire the seventh badge, but at a pretty significant cost. Rest in peace, Goliath. Before continuing on, Coulomb evolves into a monstrous Magneton, which should definitely add some much-needed power to our team, since we've lost a lot of our members. Next up is preventing Team Rocket's takeover in Goldenrod City. We can actually infiltrate their ranks, and man, having a Weezing with a Team Rocket uniform just feels right. Oh, you just had to ruin the moment, didn't you, Nimona? Well, we can still get in character and try to terrorize the locals for a bit. Then this guy says, What kind of business does Team Rocket have here? We aren't selling sanity. 
What a savage. When I try to infiltrate Team Rocket's operation, Chaz shows up and makes me roll a stealth check. Natural one. That's foolish, you shouldn't wear those things! I knew I should have Eevee trained more in dexterity. Well, I guess I'll have to settle for the direct approach. Between Geertrude's Earthquake and Coulomb's Thundershock, we're able to get through the radio tower without issues until we finally meet Petrel again, who is disguised as the director. How come he gets to dress up? Petrel has six team members, five coughings and a wheezing, and to make matters worse, they all know self-destruct. But between Geertrude, Coulomb, and Nimona's good defenses, we managed to get through the battle without losing anyone. That definitely could have gone worse. You guys rock. Uh, no pun intended. There's a big bump in the level cap for the last gym, so before heading into the basement to fight more of Team Rocket, we get some team upgrades with Symbol evolving into an awesome dugong and Geertrude evolving into a beastly golem at level 37. What? Golem evolves by trade evolution? Uh, my cartridge must be glitched. Yeah, that's it. Cartridge. Next up is another rival fight with Chaz. He leads with Golbat, but Coulomb is able to take him out after a couple of attacks. Luckily, his starter is still a Quilava because it doesn't evolve until 36. So I switch into Geertrude and destroy it with a super effective Earthquake. I use Coulomb again to take out his Sneasel. Then he uses his Magnemite and actually traps Coulomb with Magnet Pull. Is this really what you want? I'm not trapped in here with you. You're trapped in here with me. Coulomb asserts his dominance, and then we switch into Nimona for his Haunter and eliminate it with super effective assurance to win the match. After fighting off some burglars with Symbol, we rescue the director and battle a couple more Team Rocket execs before facing off against the new leader of Team Rocket himself, Archer. Symbol is able to take out his first Hound Hour easily and deal big damage to his Hound Doom with Surf. We switch out to Geertrude for the Earthquake KO and switch again into Nimona so she can assert her dominance over his coughing for the win. Team Rocket is no more. At least until Ultra Sun and Moon when Giovanni comes back again. With all that done, we can pick up the Never Melt Ice and Ice Path and finally make our way to Blackthorn City, the home of the Dragon-type gym. We can also check on our EVs by talking with this girl, since she'll give our Pokémon a ribbon if they're done EV training. Pretty helpful. After defeating all the gym trainers, I realize that we can actually get another encounter back in Ecruteak City by entering the Bell Tower. We find a Ghastly and name her Arugula. You know, like Arugula, but with ghoul instead. Oh brother, this guy stinks! After murdering what had to be hundreds of Psyducks and Magikarps, we get some awesome team upgrades. Our, uh, cartridge allows Coulomb to evolve into a Magnazone at level 40. Arugula eventually evolves into a terrifying Gengar, and I even managed to fit in some attack EV training against Goldeens to evolve Arnold into a Machoke. But that's about as much grinding as I can take right now, so it's time to battle none other than the 8th and final gym leader, Claire, the Dragon-type specialist. She sends out Gyarados, so I send out Coulomb. We can soak up the Intimidate, since Coulomb is a special attacker, and strike back with a super discharge for the one-hit KO. Didn't stand a chance. She sends out one of her two Dragonairs, and we send out Symbol. But even with the Never Melt Ice boosting our Ice-type moves, Symbol still doesn't manage to one-shot the Dragonair, because she has a minus special attack nature. Claire paralyzes us and full restores, but another Aurora Beam and Ice Shard is enough to take it down. Out comes the second Dragonair, and the same strategy eliminates this one as well. But now Claire sends out her heavy hitter, Kingdra. I was trying to at least lower its health a little, but she spams Smokescreen of all things, and Symbol keeps missing Aurora Beams until she eventually manages to hit one after being struck down to the red. I need to switch here, but I brought a Sunkern I had caught way back in National Park just in case we needed to sack something. Our accidental Sunkern lives up to its name and buys us a free switch in. Coulomb comes in swinging with a critical hit discharge, ending the battle and earning us the last gym badge. Claire is not a fan of this ending though, and she forces us to go talk to some old dudes in a hidden temple. Turns out, they're actually pretty chill, and not only do they make Claire give us the last badge, but they also give us a Dratini that we nicknamed Quetzal. I'm pretty happy with my team though, and I felt like using a Dragonite might make the Elite Four a little too easy, so into the box it goes for now. 
But before we can face the Elite Four, we have to battle the Kimono Girls, which is actually really challenging since it's five consecutive fights and you can't heal or switch your team around in between. Now, I was originally planning on using Cinnabon as our fighting type, but as I mentioned, Water Stones are really hard to come by in this game, and I just didn't end up finding any. So I decide to train Arnold instead, and he evolves into a super swole Machamp. And we're ready to take on the Kimono Girls. The first up is Umbreon, so I lead with Arnold. She hits us with Confuse Ray, but I had attached a Persum Berry to Arnold to cure the confusion, and he takes it down with another Revenge. Next up is the one I was fearing, Espeon. I really didn't have a good answer for it, because I wanted to save Coulomb for the Vaporeon at the end. So I had to switch into Bakura, who tanks a Psychic to less than a third. He manages to deal some damage with Fly, but gets taken down by Espeon Swift. I switch into Arugula for the Shadow Ball Revenge Kill. You fought valiantly, Bakura. The next battle is with Flareon, who hits us with Will-O-Wisp and gets the burn. But that's actually good for us because of Arnold's Guts ability. So Guts boosted double power revenge knocks out Flareon in one hit. Nice. Jolteon is dealt with by switching into Geertrude for Earthquake, and since Arnold got burned, he can easily knock out the Vaporeon with another super powered revenge. Maybe I didn't need to sacrifice Bakura here, but I wasn't planning to use him for the Elite Four, and it was much safer this way. That said, he did help us quite a bit over the course of the run, so rest in peace. Anyway, onward to the Elite Four! At the end of Victory Road, we get to fight our rival one more time. But since the level cap is much higher, he doesn't really stand a chance and we can sweep through his team pretty easily. After spending some time leveling up, equipping items, and making sure we filled out all of our EVs, it's finally time to take on the Elite Four. The first member is the Psychic Trainer, Will. But Arugula takes out all of her rage and one-shots every member of his team with Stab's super effective Shadow Ball or Sludge Bomb. What a beast. The second member of the Elite Four is the former gym leader and poison specialist, Koga. He sends out Ariados first, but it turns out that Coulomb perfectly counters his entire team because Steel is immune to poison and he resists any other damaging moves they have. Coulomb manages to discharge everything in his way up to Muck. Muck tries to minimize over and over to raise evasiveness, but Coulomb has a 100% accurate Magnet Bomb that negates the evasion boost and eventually secures the win. That's two down. The third Elite Four is Bruno, the fighting type trainer. He leads with Hitmontop, and I send out Arugula again. Hitmontop doesn't have anything that can actually hurt Arugula, so I decide to use this opportunity to force Bruno's full restore before fainting his lead Pokemon. Using a combination of Shadow Ball and Confuse Ray, the plan works, and we're able to take it down with a couple more attacks. He sends out Hitmonlee next, so I switch into Arnold, who I had pre-poisoned for the power boost on Guts. He uses Swagger to confuse us, but I attach a Persim Berry to cure Arnold of the confusion. He confuses us again with Swagger, but now our attack is dangerously high, and Arnold breaks through confusion with a tripled attack Guts boosted revenge for the KO. Out comes his own Machamp, who misses his cross chop and we break out of confusion for another super powered revenge. And his next few Pokemon go down the same way. Arnold is a monster. The last Elite Four member is Karen, the Dark type trainer. She sends in Umbreon, so I lead with Arnold. I had attached another Persim Berry thinking she would use Confuse Ray, but she goes for double team raising her evasiveness. And I start thinking, oh no, I used an 80% accuracy cross chop, but Arnold lands it anyway for the clean OKO. Wow, did not expect that. She switches into Murkrow and I can't leave him in, so I switch into Coulomb for a discharge, which KOs the Murkrow as well. Out comes her scariest Pokemon, Houndoom. I switch to Symbol for the fire resistance, but her Houndoom uses Nasty Plot, which doubles its already high special attack. Not good. I attached a Choice Scarf onto Symbol so she could outspeed, but it isn't enough to KO. But she just went for another Nasty Plot, so we can hit another Surf to bring it down. You shouldn't have gotten greedy, Karen. She sends out Vileplume next, and Choice Scarf locks us into Surf, so I have to switch. I bring out Nimona, who gets paralyzed on the switch, and she lands a critical hit pedal dance to bring us down to about half. But I taught Nimona Fire Blast of all things. Who knew, right? I originally planned to use it against Koga's Fortress, but this works out too. 
we land two fire blasts back to back to take her down before she sends in Gengar. Now this Gengar can be especially troublesome because it knows Destiny Bond, a move that kills the enemy if it is also knocked out in the same turn. It hits us with a Focus Blast and we use Assurance, but I decide it's too dangerous to stay in and switch into Arugula while dodging the Focus Blast. Then we can slam it with Shadow Ball before it has any chance to use Destiny Bond. Only one more to go. The champion of the Pokemon League, the Dragon Tamer Lance himself. He sends out Gyarados, and I send out Coulomb. It hits us with Waterfall, and we set up Light Screen. It lands another Waterfall down to about half, and we discharge to take it out. Lance sends in his Charizard next, and we switch in Geertrude, who shrugs off a Fire Fang pretty easily. Geertrude hasn't played much of a role in the Elite Four yet, but my plan is coming together. Geertrude tanks a Dragon Claw, and we use Defense Curl. Charizard hits us with Air Slash, doesn't flinch us, and we initiate Project Rollout. You may not know, but if you use Defense Curl prior to Rollout, it doubles the power of Rollout. Geertrude starts the Rollout and one-shots the Charizard. Rollout will also keep doubling in power each turn it successfully lands. Light Screen wears off though, and he sends in Dragonite and tries to hit us with Blizzard. We did attach a Yachi Berry to weaken its power, but luckily it ended up missing. Rollout brings it down to a sliver, and Lance spends his turn on a full restore only for another rollout to take it down. He sends out his second Dragonite, and that goes down to another rollout too. Oh man. Out comes his third and final Dragonite. Geertrude tanks a Dragon Rush and slams it with a fifth rollout to one-shot Lance's last Dragonite. The only way that could have gone better is if we got a higher roll on the first Dragonite, but I definitely can't complain. Geertrude, you are a beast. Lance sends out his last Pokemon, an Aerodactyl. Now, I would feel kind of bad about sacking Gertrude after that epic display, so I switch out to Nimona, who takes a Crunch and a Rock Slide to above half. Sludge Bomb does a lot less than I thought, though, and the Safeguard, one of Lance's Dragonites used earlier, prevents us from poisoning the Aerodactyl. After trading some hits, it's clear Nimona is losing the fight. Unfortunately, we don't have any good switches, and Aerodactyl would outspeed everything on our team because I kept the Choice Scarf on symbol just in case the rollout plan didn't work out. Unfortunately, I know what has to be done. Aerodactyl hits us with another Rock Slide low, and Nimona makes the ultimate sacrifice. She uses Explosion, taking out both herself and Lance's last Pokémon, winning us the battle and securing our spot as the champion of the Pokémon League. But that's not the end of the run. There's still one major challenge left for us. Well, maybe two more challenges. Stupid trash switches! The Kanto gym leaders don't pose much of a problem since we have a fully EV trained team by this point in the game. So after training up Quetzal and paying our respects to the teammates we've lost, there's only one battle left. The legendary Pokemon trainer himself, Red. I send out Geertrude, and Red sends out his level 88 Pikachu. Pikachu uses Iron Tail, but misses and we slam it with super effective Earthquake. We would have lived it, but not taking the hit is definitely a good start. Red switches in Lapras, and we don't want to switch anything in to a 100% accurate Stab Blizzard, so Geertrude stays in, but we attach to Yachi Berry, which weakens its power, and she survives to hit Lapras with an Earthquake. Again, I can't really switch anything in, so she takes a brine, and Geertrude goes down. We send in Coulomb, equipped with a Choice Scarf, so he can outspeed and take out Lapras with a super effective Thunderbolt. But next, he sends out his Charizard. I want to keep Coulomb in the back, just in case we need him for the Blastoise, so I switch in Symbol to tank a Flare Blitz. She takes an Air Slash as well, but returns fire with a Surf, only for Charizard to live it in the red, even after Hail Damage. That minus special attack nature is really rough. We can try to finish it with Priority Ice Shard, only for Red to switch out into Venusaur. We try to go for our own Blizzard, but Venusaur lands a Sleep Powder, and we're stuck. Symbol takes a super effective Giga Drain, but I had attached a Rindo Berry, and we survive. But unfortunately, she's still asleep, so Venusaur lands another Giga Drain, and Symbol goes down. But now I can send out our newest team member, Quetzal, the Dragonite. Somehow Venusaur outspeeds our Dragonite and tries to hit us with a Sleep Powder, 
but misses so Quetzal can take to the air and land a super effective fly to take him down. Next up is Snorlax, and Dragonite lands another fly, bringing him down to half. Unfortunately, he also takes a 4 times super effective Blizzard. Luckily, we also attached a Yachi Bear to Quetzal, and he managed to live it at around half health. I decide to go for another fly, and we take out Red Snorlax. We're almost there. He brings out Charizard once again, and I try to finish it with priority extreme speed, but Red uses a full restore, bringing Charizard back from the brink. Oh man. Maybe I should have used extreme speed again just for more damage, but Quetzal goes down to a Dragon Pulse. I send out Coulomb again, still equipped with a Choice Scarf for extra speed, but it isn't enough and Charizard outspeeds us with a super effective Flare Blitz. Luckily, Coulomb's defenses hold out and we can respond with a huge Thunderbolt to finally finish off Charizard. And now Red sends out his last Pokémon, Blastoise. Somehow, Blastoise is able to outspeed us and land a 70% accurate Focus Blast. I guess I underestimated his speed and Coulomb goes down too. I switch in Arnold, who is pre-poisoned again, and Blastoise hits us with a blizzard that Arnold tanks like an absolute Ma Champion, only to respond with a guts-boosted, double-powered revenge which one-shots Blastoise, winning us the battle and ending the run. The credits finally roll, and we were able to beat Pokémon Heart Gold and successfully finish our first Hardcore Nuzlocke. It was definitely challenging at times, but I had a ton of fun playing through the game. If you want to see more Pokémon, Yu-Gi-Oh! or other games, please subscribe for more and leave a comment on what you would want to see next. Thanks so much for watching, I will see you guys next time. I hope you have a great day, and God bless.